You can. Hello, everyone. Good morning from a bright and sunny UK. Uh, surprisingly, somehow everything feels better when there's blue sky in the morning. Uh, good afternoon to those of you who are uh, in a different time zone or maybe even good evening. Um, it's lovely to see you all here. Uh, so for the next sort of 50 minutes or so, we're going to be thinking about developing learner confidence in speaking skills. Um, I think learner confidence is an interesting uh, topic to think about because it kind of pushes you as a teacher to think about your lessons from a slightly different angle and perhaps more from the perspective of the actual learners themselves. And it can help us think about how they feel during a lesson, which I think is just as important as, as what they're learning. And as we're going to see, actually, can, there's a sort of correlation between the two. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to start by asking you a question, if that's OK. Um, you've come to this webinar, presumably you uh, have learners who perhaps lack confidence. Um, I know that I have in the past, not always, but um, there's certainly usually one or two in every class. So why do learners lack confidence when speaking in English in your experience? Could you add your ideas to the chat box, please? Um, and I'm just going to open it up and see if I can see your comments. Okay, so Richard, I can't see the comments at the moment, but I'm going to assume that you are all uh, sharing your ideas. So um, just please... to say, oh, yes, the yeah. chat boxes should be available on your right hand side um, of the screen mm -hmm. um, next to questions. Yep, so you can uh, hopefully type your ideas into there. Oh, actually, it, uh, um, I think it's actually there's the, the issue is that there aren't, um, we have people answering questions, which is fine, because I think the chat box may not be available in this particular instance. So there we have people saying that some people are afraid of mistakes because yeah. they feel insecure and they're afraid of making mistakes. Mm -hmm. They don't want to know what to say. Um, they lack practice. They yeah. don't have enough vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, they, might, they might be afraid of being made fun of. Um, yeah. Some students, Spanish students, feel that they have a, a lot of accent. Okay. Um, and we've had a question. Could you repeat the question again, actually? Somebody's quite, asked you to do that. Oh, so the question is, um, I'm just trying to find out my thing. So why do learners lack confidence when speaking in English? We've also had somebody say um, because of shyness. Um, yeah. But the main the main response has been a lot of being afraid of making mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah. So that is always a concern, isn't it? Learners always worry about that. And it's trying to create that environment where we encourage learners to kind of attempt to, to, to you know, take risks and therefore mistakes are part of that. And that's absolutely fine. Um, OK, uh, thank you very much for that. So um, let's think, first of all, about what we mean by confidence because I think that's really important. Um, it's not necessarily your confidence in yourself and your character or anything like that. We're actually talking about self-efficacy and self-efficacy is um, what Bandura describes as a belief in one's capabilities to organize and execute the courses of action required to produce given attainments. Uh, so uh, if we simplify that a little bit it's basically a learner's belief in their ability to do tasks in order to achieve a, a particular goal, in order to, to, to make progress, to, to communicate effectively. So in speaking, it's about communication, isn't it, in the, in the language classroom, being able to communicate ideas, to understand other people's ideas, to share ideas and so on. So that's what we're talking about. It's about performance in tasks. And if you look at um, sort of influence of self-efficacy, if we think if we look at literature and research, there does seem to be some agreement uh, among researchers and writers that there is a correlation between self-efficacy and goal setting. So if you have high self-efficacy and you have a strong belief in your abilities, then you set you know, big goals for yourself, you set uh, challenging goals um, because you think you can achieve them. But if you have low self-efficacy, then you set goals which aren't all that challenging. Then there's a correlation between goal setting, uh, sorry, between self-efficacy and performance. So if uh, it's a bit like that saying, isn't it? If you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. 
Um, if you have expectations that you can achieve your goal and you can perform well, then you probably will perform well. Um, if you feel that you can't do it, then you're probably not going to be able to do it. And research does seem to show that. There's also a correlation between self-efficacy and motivation and effort. So, of course, you don't necessarily feel motivated if you feel if you don't have confidence in your ability to do something and you probably don't want to put a lot of effort into it either. But if you have high self-efficacy, then you have high motivation and you might put in a lot of effort. Just mentioned risk taking when we talked about um, making mistakes. A lot of you mentioned that that is one of the reasons why learners don't want to speak. Obviously, there is a, a, a correlation between self-efficacy and risk taking. So the, high, the higher your self-efficacy, the more willing you are to take risks um, and care less about those errors. Whereas if you have low self-efficacy, then you don't really want to take risks because I guess that's going to affect your self-efficacy again, isn't it? Because it just makes you feel like you're, you're a bit silly and you can't do it properly. Um, there's also uh, a correlation between self-efficacy and the use of learning strategies. So learners with high self-efficacy tend to have learning strategies. They know what to do in order to be successful. Uh, and I guess that comes from, um, well, it's, you know, success breeds success. The more you are successful in something, then the more you understand how to be successful and you have those learning strategies available to you. So that can, that's what self-efficacy can influence in the classroom. And all of those things, I think, are incredibly important. We want learners to set challenging goals, to um, be able to perform. We need them to have motivation and effort, to take risks and to have the learning strategies they need to succeed. Because when they do that, we have this nice cycle here, don't we? The learners have confidence. They set a, a challenging goal. They feel motivated because they think they can achieve it. They put in the effort. They take risks. They utilize the learning strategies they have. They achieve their goal. Confidence increases, self-efficacy increases, and the cycle continues. But if you have the opposite, if you lack confidence, you might have low expectations. And even with low expectations, it's going to impact on motivation because you think, why should I bother if I'm going to have so little reward? And you put in minimal effort and you're scared of taking risk because it's going to impact on how you feel again in future. You might not be sure how to achieve your goal because you don't necessarily have the strategies. So you might not achieve your goal or you might achieve your goal to some degree, but it's fairly low level goal. So that doesn't really give you the confidence that you need to create that lovely positive cycle we just saw. In fact, it's just going to make you feel worse for next time. So if you have learners in particular who are kind of pushed to learn English, uh, haven't necessarily chosen it themselves and are already perhaps struggling with motivation, then confidence can have a big impact on that, I think. So again, if we look at literature and research at what influences self-efficacy, there seems to be agreement that these things um, have an influence. Successful past experience. So it's the cycle we just looked at. If you do something well in class, if you perform a role play well in class, then next time you have to do that kind of activity, you're going to feel that you can do it again and that you have a higher self-efficacy. Therefore, you perform better and so on. Task difficulty also has an impact. If the task is too difficult for you, then you're going to, well, you're probably going to be, uh, you're going to give up more easily if you have low self-efficacy because you don't feel that you can actually achieve the task because you haven't done it before. So why would you do it again? So that successful past experiences can have an effect on, on how much you, how much effort you put into task difficulty. But also we need to make sure that difficulty is achievable for all learners in the classroom. Positive feedback from others can influence self-efficacy. So, um, uh, you know, hearing it from your peers and hearing it from your teacher can help you to feel that you can actually achieve something and gives you the motivation to do that. And also, when you look at your peers and you see them doing something successfully, that, that, that can also make you believe that you can do it yourself. So with, when I'm talking about peers, it might not necessarily be everyone in the class, but it's going to be those people that you identify with as a learner. So those people that are that you sort of work with that perhaps you see as quite similar to yourself. So, again, you can encourage each other. Now, I think that peer successful performance is something that we allow learners to to 
recognize a lot in the classroom or at least we give them exposure to peers performances because we do a lot of care work don't we? we do a lot of group work we might give demonstrations in front of the class where we use a learner um, that kind of thing learners are exposed to their partner or other people in the group they're exposed to their performance so they can see when someone is doing doing it successfully and they can then recognize that and hopefully use that to build their own self-efficacy um, but what I'd like to do for the rest of the session is kind of focus on how we can help learners to have successful experiences so that that then helps them for the future, builds their self-efficacy across your course, how we can address task difficulty and how we can ensure that learners receive positive feedback from you and also from others, also constructive feedback, but that, that there is certainly a focus on positive things. I think sometimes um, certainly from lessons that I observe and also when I think about my own lessons for a very very long time feedback tended to consist of error correction quite often and sometimes didn't necessarily focus as much or equally on what was done well uh, and I think that is important as we'll talk about later. So um, what I'd like to start with is thinking about objectives because um, we need to help learners to uh, identify objectives because when learners know what they're learning they're much more likely to identify or recognize progress and also um, hopefully if we're helping them to set objectives by setting them ourselves or in you know involving them in some way perhaps but also guiding them we can help them to set objectives which are realistic for them and we can also help them to achieve those objectives um, I remember a really long time ago in my career, um, I was teaching a class of uh, A2 plus learners. They were all male. They were extremely um, enthusiastic, very competitive with each other. They were a really, really lovely, memorable class, but um, trying to control them could be quite difficult at times. And at the end of the session, I actually felt like I was, you know, I've been in a boxing ring. Um, so I asked my director of studies to come along and observe to give me some advice on how I could deal with that class. He turned up, he sat at the back of the room and of course they all behaved perfectly and um, the observation really was a bit of a waste of time for him because um, he couldn't really see what they, what they did in, in normal practice. But at the end of the lesson I heard him talking to some of the students and he was asking them some questions and so I asked him what he was asking them and what he asked them was, what did you learn today? And the student said, we learnt about animals. Well, my objective for the lesson was um, to be able to talk about hypothetical situations using the second conditional. Animals was only the topic, that was not the actual learning objective. So what that meant was that learners went away from that lesson, not really understanding exactly what they were trying to achieve and therefore how did they know if they'd achieved it? Um, for some learners, they will have recognised what they were doing and why, and they'll have recognised progress. But for some learners, they really wouldn't. They just come, they passively attend lessons, they go home. And that doesn't help to build self-efficacy or confidence. So uh, what we can do is we can share learning objectives with students. So we can firstly be very clear about a speaking lesson. What is my speaking objective for this lesson? What will learners be able to do at the end of the lesson that they couldn't do at the beginning of the lesson? Or perhaps better, in fact, probably it's going to be better than they could do at the beginning of the lesson. For example, I can compare, compare two places. So putting it as a can-do statement so that learners can identify with it. Um, so we can we can share that with them in the classroom. We might do it at the beginning of the class or maybe after the warmer once we've warmed them up. It could even be sort of a third of the way through the lesson where we can get them to guess. Do you know what our objective is today based on what they've been looking at already? I know uh, teachers who might gap their learning objective because just telling a learner doesn't necessarily mean they actually take it in. So we might want them to do something with that objective so we could gap it. So I can, and they have to guess the missing word, which would be make recommendations, or um, you could put them and they have to, uh, you have to put them in the right order. So again, it's getting learners to just focus on them and actually think about it a bit more carefully. You see, you know, we always have to make everything into a task, don't we, in the English language classroom? Or uh, we could, um, we could uh, actually get them to read the objective. I can make an arrangement with a friend and get them thinking about when we kind of do that thing, 
when it might be useful for them, when they need to make recommendations, when they might need to compare things and so on, just to get them thinking about why it's a useful objective for them. And if it's not a useful objective for them, then as a teacher, we need to think about why we're actually focusing on that in the lessons, I guess. Um, I mean, we need to account for the whole class, of course, not individual learners. We need to account for the, the majority. Um, so the majority of the class should find it useful. One thing that is really useful when we're dealing with confidence or self-efficacy is getting learners to rate their level of confidence. It gives us as teachers a really valuable uh, piece of information about how learners feel about something. But if we do at the beginning of the lesson, it also gets them reflecting on how they feel about it as well, which can be very useful for them. It's part of their part of the learning process. And for weaker learners that don't have learning strategies, it can help them to sort of develop a bit of a, a more of awareness of, of learning and how we learn and so on. So just put a scale on the board, one to five or one to 10, give them the can do statement so I can uh, make arrangements with a friend. And then they have to write down a number on their notepad, one to five, how confident they feel. So one is not very confident, five is very confident. And you walk around the room and just get a, a sense from their numbers of how they're feeling in general. Um, it makes, it can raise their awareness that they don't know something or they don't know how to do something and therefore it makes them ready to okay great so I'm going to learn something sometimes you get learners who put five and then during the lesson they start to realize that actually they couldn't do it as well as they thought so they adjust that but I think that's good because it means that their confidence is more in line with their competence um, but it also identifies those learners who lack confidence in their ability. So you can then perhaps make sure that you do things in the lesson that we're going to look at that will help them to, to boost that confidence and to feel uh, more positive about uh, completing a task, a speaking task and actually performing effectively. Uh, so we can also, of course, come back to this at the end of the lesson. We'll look at that later when we look at learner reflection. We can help learners to set their own goals. And again, this is part of reflection. So I'll mention this again later, but we can we can maybe try and encourage to, we can include students in goal setting for the lessons just by giving them options. Sometimes we have a choice. We can do this speaking objective or we can focus on this speaking objective, which you, would you prefer. And then they feel that they're taking a little bit of control. Um, but we can also make sure that we build into our course time at the end of a lesson, at the end of a unit to set their own objectives. So reflecting on their performance in the lesson and just realizing what they need to do to improve and thinking about how they can do it and when they will do it and how they will do it. So learners then are now clear about what their learning goal is of the lesson. We're doing a speaking lesson. This is the final goal. Uh, for example, I can uh, make an arrangement with a friend. But we need to help students to achieve those objectives because if they don't, they're going to lose self-efficacy. They're not going to feel confident and that's going to have an impact on future learning. So um, we need to think about, uh, along with the objective, we need learners to be clear about how they can achieve that objective. So at the end of the lesson, we're going to do this lovely speaking activity, uh, which will help learners to make arrangements. They're going to go around the class. They're going to try and make arrangements with other students. They're going to add them to their calendar. So they have a calendar. They have to fill in the dates. They have to try and make as many arrangements as possible to try and create the busiest week. So when students do that task, at the end of it, they should be able to reflect on it and say, yes, I made arrangements successfully with other people. And they, can, they should be able to recognize what they did well and maybe what they could improve next time. But the only way they can do that is actually to um, think about success criteria. Um, John Hattie, Professor John Hattie, who did you know, a huge meta study into what is effective in, in education, he talks about the fact that a learning objective is useless without success criteria. And by success criteria, I mean what you need to do to achieve the objective. Um, you might know the, the term assessment rubric, something like that, but I always think assessment sounds a bit scary, like students being tested, whereas success criteria is more about, hey, this is how you can be successful. So one way we can help students to identify success criteria is to start with a model. 
uh, we can provide a model of the task that we want them to achieve. We might be able to provide this using the course book. So here you're going to make some arrangements with other students. First, listen to Jade and Sam. So they listen to that model and identify what is effective uh, about the conversation. Or if you don't have a, a nice model in the course book, then you can actually provide the model yourself. And you might want to do it yourself performing twice, or you might want to um, uh, involve a strong student and get them to read from a little script with the students focusing on you. I'm going to attempt to do it um, as two different people. So uh, I want, I'm, I'm going to do the conversation twice. And I'd like for you in the chat box, uh, you can ask the question, that's fine. Wherever you put it in the chat box, that's fine. If you can just share which conversation you think is better and why. Is it number one or is it number two? OK, so number one. Uh, and I think you're going to focus. Well, OK, not everybody in the conversation is going to, to be the same, I think. But anyway, you'll see that one is better than the other. So conversation one. Um, Hi, uh, do you fancy going to the cinema tomorrow? Can't. Oh, uh, how about Thursday? Okay. Mm, what time shall we meet? Six. Okay. Okay, that's number one. Number two. Hi, do you fancy going to the cinema on, uh, tomorrow? Sorry, I can't. I'm meeting Jane for coffee. How about Thursday? Yes, yeah, sounds good. Uh, what time should we meet? Mm, how about six outside the cinema? Great. See you then. OK, so in the chat box, I'm going to open it up. Have a look. Uh, I might not be able to see it, so I might need Richard to help me with this. But even if I can't, you can still share with each other which one was better and why. Was it number one or was it number two? So, Lindsay, I think it's in the questions um, panel. Yeah, you have, can you see the question? Yeah, add it in the questions panel. So there's a questions panel. If you just type number one or number two and give a reason why one was better than the other. And they're both communicative. They both function perfectly fine. But I think one was a bit better. One of them was a bit better. Well, we have a consistent winner. OK, which is? Which is number two. OK, good. Um, and people have said it was more fluent um, because the conversation was more developed. Um, it was because it was politer. Um, the others have said the two is better, but they both, as you say, communicated. Um, two is better because of, uh, it used fun appropriate functional language. Um, mm -hmm. Both achieved a goal. Yep. Um, better communication more clear and gives more information um there have actually been um i mean people said, have suggested one but it is i mean it's effective but boring it's effective but impolite um exactly exactly and this is the discussion that you have with students so um so the, the model is just a fantastic catalyst for discussion about what is it, what is effective in a speaking task and how students can actually, you know, perform it themselves in a way that is effective. And some learners will be able to identify that really easily and quickly themselves. They know already it's somehow they have the strategies, they have the knowledge, but some learners just don't. And we need to help them to recognize that. And what we can do then is to actually work together with learners to create this success criteria. Now. Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment, actually. I'll come back to that. Um, so uh, we might put on the board a list of criteria. It doesn't necessarily have to be in English. It could be in L1, depending on your learners. Uh, and it will be simple or complex, depending on the level of your students. Um, you can do it with children. You can have just very simple sentences. With lower levels, again, it's the language that you use that, that's important. Um, what I would say is that, for example, you know, um, and I'm assuming, by the way, that we've actually covered the language that learners would need to do the task. So they're familiar with language of invitation, that they recognise that there are these phrases that you use and that they, they come up with that when they discuss the criteria. Um, that they perhaps identified that, that the present continuous we use, was used to talk about an arrangement, for example, because they've studied it already. So um, it, the criteria can be whatever students come up with, whatever you feel, it's an agreement between the class. Students will sometimes come up with things you didn't think about. 
Um, I would say that um, when you're creating the criteria, if you're talking about language, it's always used to, useful to give examples. Um, so here, for example, at the bottom, I put use appropriate intonation, sound enthusiastic. Learners will need to know actually what that means. So that might need some modeling, might need some drilling and that kind of thing. Uh, and then I put some other prompts on the board. But now learners have this um, criteria. So they now have a much better understanding of how they can be successful in the task. And therefore, hopefully they'll be more successful in the task. So when we're dealing with speaking tasks in the classroom, there's just a little sort of um, approach that we can take. And that is to start by providing a model. Uh, or I think two models is really good as well. Uh, uh, I put good and bad here, but of course, both my models were effective. It's just that one was more effective than the other. Um, good and bad was just shorter in this pace. Um, what you choose to include in your good or your very effective and your less effective model depends on the level of your learners, of course. Um, for, uh, for A1 learners, then of course, the first model, perfect. Um, with perhaps a little bit more polite intonation, that would have worked really well. Um, but it wouldn't work well for a B2 learner, for example. So um, providing two models, because when you provide the bad model learners or less effective model, learners can see more clearly what is good about the good model. Students then brainstorm the success criteria. It brings up a lot of interesting discussion about language and use of language and things like that. It's great. Uh, then together as a class, we agree on it. We make a list on the board. Students then prepare for the task. So we give them that preparation time to actually look at the criteria and think about how they can do it, what language they're going to use. Then they do the task. And then after the task, they can actually peer or self-assess against criteria. So they can go back and they can actually tick off. They can record themselves. They can go back and actually tick off. Did I do it? How do I know I did it? Where, is, where are my examples? And they can do it with each other as well and peer assess. So it's a really nice little systematic approach we can take to speaking, speaking activities. We might not take it for every speaking activity, but I'm thinking of a sort of a big speaking activity that comes at the end of a lesson, a, a, a big speaking lesson, or at the end of um, a series of language lessons where they can use all the language that we've looked at. Um, it can be a very useful approach. Now, uh, I said I'd assumed that before learners do the speaking task that they have had the relevant language input and practice. And of course, we do need to make sure, don't we? You mentioned that learners are worried about making mistakes. They worry about um, that they might not have the language that they need to actually do the task. So we do need to make sure that before we expect learners to do a particular speaking task or to be able to achieve a speaking objective, that they have the right tools at hand. So we might do, for example, some vocabulary input where they're looking at collocations, some of which they might use when they are um, uh, making arrangements. Um, so here we've got, you know, have, a, have an appointment or make an appointment, have a barbecue, that kind of thing. We might look at present continuous for future arrangements. So when we uh, reject somebody's invitation, we often give an excuse and a reason why. So we might need uh, present continu continuous for future arrangements. And if we're going to provide this language, and it's the same with the vocabulary, you can see here that we're, we're obviously providing the vocabulary, but also learners need the controlled practice and also some personalized oral practice of that language before they actually do the communicative task. I mean, they need some practice with each language point before they put it all together for that big speaking task at the end. Um, you can see here that they've got, we've got a gap fill and that gap fill is questions and then learners then take it in turns to ask the questions so it becomes more personalized. And here with the present continuous for future arrangements, of course, you've got the control practice with the, the taking the, the verbs and putting them in the correct form. But then, of course, we've got some more con sort of semi-controlled, um, uh, semi-controlled, I suppose it is in a way, semi-controlled um, practice where learners are talking about some arrangements they have using the present continuous because you're, you're telling them what language to use. So hopefully that's going to build their confidence a bit because they've had that control practice. They've had practice talking about themselves, making sentences about themselves. So when they make arrangements, they've already used that language and hopefully that will that will help them. We can also give them some pronunciation practice. So helping them again, this is with present continuous, maybe getting them to notice that when people uh, produce the present continuous for future arrangements, we tend to contract 
the, the, the verb be and we stress the main verb, giving learners practice in that so that they can get the right intonation so that when they make arrangements, they can do it successfully. And um, then when we do the speaking task, we can give them preparation time. I think that is so important. And we can give them some useful prompts as well to help them. Do you want to go for coffee? Sounds good. We can give them that nice language. Hopefully they've already had input in this language as well for making arrangements. So that's also really important, of course, giving them practice in that, maybe giving them a very controlled dialogue, reading aloud, taking it away, seeing if they can remember it before they mingle and do the, the final speaking task. So we need to scaffold lessons carefully. We need to make sure that when we're expecting learners to achieve a speaking goal, that we have given them the right language to, to achieve it. But do you remember I said earlier that one of the problems uh, is about task difficulty? Task difficulty has an effect on self-efficacy. So we need to make sure that learners can achieve or can complete the tasks that we give them in lessons. Uh, not necessarily when we're looking just at speaking, but across all activities. But if we're thinking about the language input, we need to make sure that the language tasks they work with are achievable for all learners in the classroom. And we need to therefore work flexibly and sometimes change the way that some learners work with those tasks. Let me give you an example. So if you've been giving learners some vocabulary that they can use to make arrangements, let's say that they've done this reading here. So I think it's, uh, I'm trying to work backwards as a mirror, but anyway, on the right hand side of your screen, you can see the text uh, managing a busy week. So learners read the text, they do some reading tasks, and then they pull out the language from the context to look at the collocation. So the idea is that learners have to find the nouns in the forum post and work out which nouns go with which of the three verbs. Now, there are learners in the class that will be quite slow at doing that. They don't necessarily have the confidence to work quickly. And there are also learners that do have confidence, but are a little bit slower, a bit more methodical. And you have learners that rush through really quickly and finish quickly. Quite often, I think, and certainly with classes that I observe, teachers will stop an activity before all learners have had time to finish because maybe 70% sort of or so have finished, so they move on. But that means that some learners never actually finish the task. And that will absolutely, I'm sure, have an impact on self-efficacy because you look around and you'll see your peers um, achieving it quickly and you're not, and then you start to feel that actually they're not your peers anymore, that you are not as equal as them and that you're not as good as them and so on. So one thing we can do in this particular activity is make it more challenging for some learners. So we could say to the students, if you want a bit of a challenge, cover the reading text. First, guess whether you think do, make or have goes with each noun phrase. And, um, uh, and then you can read the article and check your ideas. That's going to take them a little bit longer than if they just find them quickly and match. And that gives the, the other learners a bit more time to, uh, to take over finding them and matching them. Learners have the choice. You monitor. And if you see learners who are quite slow attempting to do the more difficult one, you might just point out to them that within the time you've got, they might want to try it a different way. And, and that can help them to make the right choices and choose the right strategies actually in the classroom. Um, then when um, students do task uh, 2C, when they actually use the questions to have a discussion with their partners, you might want to put on the board some prompts for answers to help them with their answers. So who do you usually have lunch with? I usually dot 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 or I usually uh, eat with or something like that, just to give them a bit of a, a confidence boost, something that will help them to produce the answer uh, and complete the task. But um, they, they probably won't use them for all of them, but they might look, if they're not sure about one, they might look on the board and it just helps them to, to complete the task just as their partners are doing, um, even if they need a little bit, bit extra support. So adding support, I think, is really useful and really important. Let's think about this particular activity here. Um, for example, I'm going to hand over to you. So again, in the questions section, you can write your ideas. So if we look at this particular um, uh, if we look at 6a and 6b, what support could we add to help weaker learners that kind of struggle, might struggle with this and might struggle to achieve the task because it's possibly a little bit too difficult for them? Can you type your ideas into the question box, please? For either 6a, where they're gap filling, where they're putting the verb in the correct form, present continuous form. 
so it's present continuous for arrangements, or in exercise 6b, where they are um, predicting, oh, sorry, when they're giving arrangements about their themselves for tomorrow, next week, next month, what support might you give weaker learners to help them? Type your ideas in the question box, please. Hi Richard. Hi there, yes, we're still, it's just taking a bit of time for people to come through. Oh, you're going to have a drink or um, Well, we have a few, a few answers. Um, okay. I'd definitely put a model question on the board. Good. Um, take the first sentence as, a, as an example for everyone. Yep, okay. Um, they can use 6a to help them do 6b. Yep, okay. They can, yeah, yeah, yeah. They could use some of the verbs, couldn't they? They could take some of the verbs and use them about themselves. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, with some activities, you can actually give students options. So you could put some options on the board for the gap fill. You could give them two options and they choose maybe for the first two or three. And then they have to do the rest themselves, for example. And you say to students, if actually I tend to write these on a piece of paper and stick them at the side of the room, because then it means that not everyone looks at them automatically because it's on the board and at the front of the classroom. But they can sneak a look if they want a bit more support. I think it'd be really important on the board to have am, is, are, plus, ing, verb as a structure so that they can all follow the structure. And for exercise 6b, I might put some prompts on the board. So I'm going, I'm seeing, I'm watching, something like that so that students can also use them to, to produce their own sentences. Uh, and again, you could put them on, they could start with them, then you can rub them off so that they, uh, they then have to use their own ideas. So that, that you know, you're taking the support, support away a little bit gradually. But the problem is that when we have a learning objective in the classroom, not everyone is going to be able to achieve that objective using the material that we use in class if they're all doing the activities in the same way. In the same way. So we need to be able to add support and occasionally a bit of challenge for the stronger students to make sure that everyone can achieve the task in the time that you've got and feel that they've accomplished it because that, that impacts on self-efficacy too. OK, um, when we do the final speaking task, of course, here you've got a little model conversation. Do you want to go for coffee on Monday? Sounds good. What time? We can have that on the board or students can take their books with them and use it. And then we can encourage them to actually um, stop using it part of the way through um, or to cover part of it. Or if we have it on the board, we can do the disappearing dialogue where we start to take away words. So do you mm, we take away uh, certain language so sounds gap we delete the good what we delete the about so they start to they're producing the language and having to think about what language is missing until they can do it from scratch that means at the end of that lesson hopefully everyone can look back and think well i did complete the task i did it i did they might recognize that they needed some help and they realize that they can they do actually need to do more practice but the fact is that they felt that they achieved something just as everyone else did and that helps to build confidence so moving on to the end of the task then. Um, OK, we've got uh, five or ten minutes. That's good. Feedback and reflection. Um, in order for learners to recognize that they have made progress or that they have achieved something in a lesson, they need to be able to. We need to build in time for feedback and reflection. So um, let's think about effective teacher feedback. I'm going to throw it over to you again, if that's OK. Um, so again, in the question box, please. Can you let's imagine that a new teacher came to you and said, um, I'm not sure if I'm giving learners the right feedback uh, on their speaking in class. What advice can you give me? What advice would you give them about effective teacher feedback on speaking lessons? Please write your ideas into the speaking box. I'll give you a bit of time to do that. Yeah, people are still thinking. Okay. So what is effective feedback? A new teacher comes to you and says, I'm not sure if I'm giving feedback effectively to my students on their speaking. What advice would you give me? What would you say? 
One suggestion is to put the language on the board after the speaking task. Okay. Um, and can I just say that I would suggest that it's not just errors, but it's also examples of good language that learners used, because learners need to recognise that they that the language they used that was wet, that was good, that was effective, and recognise that actually, yeah, I need to keep doing that again. I need to make sure that I keep doing that. Anything else? Um, yes, we have um, so it's two similar uh, responses. Always focus on what they did right first, and then focus on common errors and explain these to the whole class. Okay, good. That sounds good to me. You could do the whole feedback sandwich, the whole, um, you start with the positive, you address the issues and give some constructive suggestions, and then you end with the positive again. Um, so that works really well. Although I did see a rather amusing cartoon, which was something, it was a little boy giving feedback to a little girl, and, he, and it was a feedback sandwich. He said, I like your hair, your face is ugly, your dress is pretty. I don't think that's the way to do it. <laughs> I don't think that would work. <laughs> um, 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 what I want is show the students what they can do by listing questions and then listing answers. Okay. Um, give good, proper examples. Okay, yep, yep. Take Specific note of what, examples. Sorry. It's okay. Um, take note of what works and reflect on what could be done better. Absolutely, yep, yep, great. I think they're all really good ideas. I'll share with you my ideas. Thanks, Richard. Um, so, um, there is actually, I mean, there is again quite a lot of research on, on effective feedback and, and effective feedback is based on task performance. So it's not talking about, you know, how funny learners were or something like that, unless that was part of the task, but it's talking about, you know, about their actual achievement in terms of the goal. Um, feedback needs to be clear. I know it sounds really um, simple, but actually there's research seems to show that um, learners don't always understand the feedback that they get from the teacher. They often misunderstand it. Perhaps they, they shape it to fit their idea of what they think is going on. So sometimes we need to check that they've understood the feedback as well. So it could be asking checking questions or it could be getting them to turn to a partner and summarise the feedback that you've just given just to make sure that you're all on the same page. Um, it needs to obviously be timely. So if you're doing a speaking activity, it needs to be directly after the speaking activity. It needs to help students to recognize progress. So yes, it's focusing on what you did well in this task, but also helping learners to recognize what they did better. So maybe something they couldn't do before that they can do now. Uh, and it might be individual learners that you might want to say something to, that you recognize that maybe they couldn't pronounce a word before, but they can now, and you, you just sort of point that out to them uh, as, you're, as you're monitoring later in the lesson, for example. We obviously need to help students to recognise what they can do well, what they need to do better and how they can improve. How they can improve is something that I think teachers sometimes forget. They often focus on the, well, um, OK, so you did that well. And sometimes we don't spend much attention on, pay much attention to that. We focus on lots of errors, but we don't necessarily think about, well, how can you now go away and improve for next time? And also importantly, we need to give students the opportunities to bridge the gap. So if students have recognised next time I need to sound more enthusiastic in my conversation, um, if they don't study this particular uh, skill, so uh, making arrangements, if they don't study that skill until they do a course book next year, that's a long gap. They're going to forget what they didn't do so well next time. That's not really going to help them. So actually giving them the opportunity to do the task again is really important. Maybe in a future lesson or perhaps in this lesson. Let's say you get students to work in pairs. They make an arrangement with their partner. They record it. They listen back. They self-assess against the success criteria. They reflect on what they did well and what they could do better. You give some overall feedback from your monitoring and then they take that feedback and they now do the mingle where they're doing it much more. That is effective because it's going to help them to bridge the gap and they can see that they've actually done it better the second time. So that's something that we, we really ought to consider more of, I think, is, is making sure that or getting students to repeat, if not a full speaking task, part of a speaking task to actually actively make the improvement they need to make. 
said before, uh, or I said at the beginning, that one of the th things that impact on um, self-efficacy is getting positive feedback from you, the teacher. So if we give specific feedback, if we give very clear feedback to learners, if we focus on what progress they made on what they did well, as what they could do, to, as well as what they can do to improve learners, that will help learners to build self-efficacy. But if, if we also include peer assessment into our classes, then they can learn from each other as well. And as I said earlier, with success criteria, learners are better able to provide useful feedback because they can go through, they understand what they're li listening for when they listen to their partner, do a speaking task, and they can go through and say if they think something was done or not, and the students can discuss it, they can listen to the recording. Um, and then we can give them some nice prompts to be able to give them positive feedback. So you mm -mm, very well. So, you know, you you um, uh, you use the language uh, of um, making arrangements very well. I liked the way you sounded enthusiastic. Uh, next time you could mm -mm, better. You could use uh, you could um, use present continuous better or something like that for future arrangements. Um, or something entirely different might not be on the success criteria list at all, and that's OK. So for peer assessment to work, we need to have the criteria and we can give learners useful prompts. We can get at the end of the lesson, we can get learners to come back to the can do statement. I can make a, an arrangement with a friend and they can say, how confident do you feel about that now from one to five? They write their number on their books you go around, compare uh, the number and see if they develop their confidence levels. And in my experience, mostly they put it up one, maybe two points. It's not very often that they go down. If they go down, it's because they didn't know what they didn't know and they realised they didn't know it. Or in the case of language learning, they didn't know what they had to do and therefore they were unable to sort of uh, recognise that they didn't have the ability to do it and so their confidence has dropped a little bit but that, that's usually okay because they recognize why and they recognize how they can do it in future. We might not be able to build in reflection at the end of every lesson if we have very few classes um, but I would say even one minute of reflection is just incredibly useful. We could get them to reflect at the end of a unit so looking at all the can-do statements from the unit and getting them to reflect at the end of that, that can be very useful. I did observe a lesson with a teacher who did this, all the learners had to write their answers on whiteboards and hold them up and there was one objective where they'd all put like one or two and he was really shocked because he thought they'd performed quite well but it wasn't about their performance, it was about how they felt about their performance. Yes they'd done the task but they hadn't really done it with a full understanding or full level of confidence to be able to go and do that beyond the classroom. Just one final thing, learner reflection needs to look back and it needs to look forward. So learners need to think about, for example, what can you do better now that you couldn't do at the beginning of the lesson? You need to think about what made the task difficult. Um, but then they need to look forward. What will help you to do this task better next time? What do you need to do to improve next time? How will you do it? So setting those learning goals. We need to get learners to look back at the task and think about what that means forward for goal setting. Um, because then when they're goal setting, obviously that they're gonna hopefully recognize that there are goals that they can achieve. They, they understand how to achieve them. And all of this helps to develop self-efficacy. So then, I have talked about ways that we can help to, to build learner confidence. Um, and I talked about how we can help learners to set learning objectives or at least make them aware of the learning objectives that we set them in the classroom. Because when learners know what they're trying to achieve in a speaking lesson, they're much more likely to be able to recognize what they're doing and uh, and recognize if they've done it. And if they recognize progress, even if it's not full progress, any progress that they recognize will help to build confidence. Um, we need though to help learners to understand how to achieve those learning objectives. So we need them to recognize success criteria. We need them to understand what they need to do to be able to be successful in a speaking task and achieve the learning objective. We need to add support for learners when we're doing tasks in the classroom because not every learner will be able to do the exercise and, and, do, and be successful in the exercise as everyone else in the classroom. So sometimes we need to add a bit of support by adding some prompts on the board, 
giving options, uh, answer options, sticking them on a piece of paper at the side of the board for learners to sneak a look at if they need some help. They are still working with the same language. They're just working at it at a certain level. They're having a bit more support, but at least they can achieve the tasks. They feel that they can achieve the tasks. And when they feel they can achieve the tasks and they have a successful uh, su learning experience, then they feel that they can have future successful learning experiences. It builds motivation. It helps them to um, motivate them to put in more effort. And they're much more likely to take risks if they are not terrified of, of um, losing even more confidence than they already have. And also we said that um, learners achieve self-confidence when they receive positive feedback from uh, others, so teachers and peers, and also I would argue themselves. So that feedback needs to be constructive. It needs to very much focus on the positive as well as things like errors, but it also needs to make it clear to learners what they need to achieve, how they can do it. And all of these things will help learners to, to, to continue to make achievements which build that self-efficacy. So that brings me, uh, I think I'm just going to move on from that because of timing and I want to make sure we've got lots of question, time for questions for you. So uh, just to make you aware that the examples I gave today came from um, Pearson's New General English course book series, which is called Roadmap. Uh, Richard mentioned earlier, I'm one of the authors. I'm a co-author of A2 and A2+. Plus. Uh, you can find out more information about Roadmap at the website here. Um, this is also one of a series of webinars. Um, we have other webinars coming up where we're looking at really the, the principles that we base Roadmap on and, and looking at you know, uh, why we've created the material in the way that we've created. So we really wanted to help learners to develop their self-confidence with the book. So we have very clear learning objectives for speaking lessons and other skills lessons as well. We really scaffold the lessons and try and help and add support and add the things that learners need to build that confidence. Um, on the 21st of May, Hugh Della will be here talking about uh, his topic is Back to the Future, Planning for Success. And he's going to talk about how when you plan lessons, you can actually work backwards uh, in terms of how you structure your lesson, which sounds very interesting. Uh, and also, I'll be back on the 28th of May talking about developing, not testing receptive skills. So if you are interested in listening and reading skills, I think I will... Um, give you something to think about with that. But for now, we have time for questions. So if you'd like to type your questions in the question box on the right-hand side of your uh, screen, please do, and I will try and answer them.